just continue I put to run our bounds. Okay. I found it and thought you would. Just do specific words that are up on the screen and put some melody with it. And that's what you call singing. So just keep on. Alright? How majestic is your name? Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic. Sunday, May the 18th, after the service, and June the 8th would be homecoming. I guess three weeks from today is Easter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow. I love Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, well, wait a minute, let me finish. I paused too long in there and gave you a chance to jump in. Well, maybe I just keep my mouth shut, like you said. Maybe I would be better off. But I believe that Easter for the Christian should be the most exciting holiday that we have. Amen. If it wasn't for what happened on Easter, you and I would have no hope today. But because. Right. Jesus Christ arose on Easter Sunday morning. You and I have a hope beyond this world. Praise this wonderful name. We're glad you're here today. Glad that you've come to share in this service. Let's go to Heavenly Prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence, Lord, what a privilege and what an honor it is to be able to come to your house to worship and praise your holy name. And as we gather this morning, Lord, in your name, I pray that you would come and meet with us in a very special way. I pray that each heart and each life that is gathered here, Lord, you would touch them at the point of their need today, that they might feel and sense your power at work in their life. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for providing a way of salvation that we, through our sinfulness, might be reconciled to you and how that is that one day we will be able to stand in your presence. Heavenly Father, bless in everything that we say and do this morning that it might bring honor and glory to Jesus. For his name we pray. Amen. Stand with me, please. Oh, how can Jesus?
everybody say? Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated now. One of our favorite times of the day, Sunday, is giving time. Isn't that wonderful? The pastor preached on it a couple of weeks ago. Amen. And I increased my giving. Now, isn't that good? Amen. Now, isn't that good? I got something good out of that. <laughs> Right. Well, we want to worship the Lord with these tithes and offerings, ushers, if you can. Sam, would you offer the Lord some praise? Father, we are so thankful that our Redeemer lives today. Amen. We thank the Lord for the gift.
we invite you to family altar if you have a special need or burden you want to bring to the Lord, would you come? Our Father God, as we come before you this morning, our minds just kind of wander around. Sometimes it seems like we're just Every Monday is the same old, same old. But I wonder what would happen if this next Monday were the day that you decided you were going to come back to the church. And the rapture would take place. Would we all make it? I pray, Lord, today that your Holy Spirit would go across our sanctuary and speak to each of our lives. And Lord, our hearts goal is that all of us would have a good life here on the earth and we'd spend eternity with you in heaven. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to realize that there's some things that we need to do. It's not just a gimme, but how wonderful it is to know that in spite of all things you love us, we look at a lot of things that are happening in the world today. We, we read statistics about how there's a great falling away from all churches, not just one church or one denomination. And we're seeing it. We're living in a day and an age where people are saying, I don't need the church. I don't need God. I'm not even sure there is a God. Well, these things that were all part of prophecy that we're seeing being fulfilled right today. We know that Rosh will be the king of the north that will attack the Holy Man. And we are watching the world news and seeing what's going on in Russia right now with this great acquisition of power. I think it's getting close, Lord. I pray that you would just speak to each of our hearts. If there's anything that would prevent us from making heaven our home, help us to see that. Speak to our hearts today in a special way. And then, Lord, there are many, many men and needs in our church today. We think of Jessica that's home with a fever today, and we just lift her up to you. And she's such a special little lady. Just touch her and bring healing to her. Lord, we think of our three ladies that would be here if they could. Thank Lord and Clara and Maggie and Lucy. We lift these three up to you and pray that you just touch them in a special way. And let them know that their church is lifting their names up, that we haven't forgotten them. We're praying for them. And then, Lord, we continue to lift up Andy Casey to you. And he's going through so much. But you've just come a long way. Still has more to go, but Lord, uh, it's great to hear this positive attitude that he's showing. And we just pray that you'd be with the therapists and doctors and give them special guidance and wisdom to touch him in a special way. We think of Sam's brother-in-law, Tom, that's uh, very soon going to be going on to face a turn, and we just pray for him. Good to hear that he knows you. But we pray that you bless him and his wife and Sam's other sister. Sometimes when we're younger, we think, oh, how great it will be to get old and be able to retire and not have any responsibilities. But sad to say, in many cases, the old body just falls apart about that time. and We seem to have more problems than we ever imagined. But I pray, Lord, for this family that you bless them in a special way. And Lord, I, I see moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas kneeling at the altar, and I believe some of them are here for their kids that are insane, their grandkids that are insane. We lift them all up to you. We pray, Lord, that you give them a burden that they've never experienced before to pray and to share and to reach out to their kids and grandkids. Father, we, we want you to know that we love you today and we thank you for everything that you've done and all that you're doing. And then, Lord, we pray especially for these at your altar. Pray that you would just minister to them. They might sense your presence and know beyond a shadow of doubt that you're hearing their prayers right now. What a wonderful God you are that you love us so much. Just minister to each one that's down here and let them sense your presence. Let them know that you're still in charge, that you care. And Lord, we just want you to know again, so many times we tell you we love you, but we really do. Bless our country. 
bless our leadership, and I pray that you would speak to their lives and their hearts and help them to realize time is short. And then start with our president, our Congress, our state, county, and city leaders. We pray, Lord, for our working witness team that's down in Cuba right now. We pray that you bless each member down there, that they may be the great example of Christ to those people. Bless Russ and Brother Sister Gail, Lord, and pray that she just touch them. Bless the church of the Nazarene. Help us to be the denomination that makes a difference. Father, we thank you, Captain Blue's aunt that's in hospice, and we just lift her up to you. Pray she'd be close to Kathy, who's been at her side 24-7, close to Kathy. Watch over each one of us now. Father, as we prayed each Sunday, we ask that you'd walk around her altar and up and down each pew. And would you give each one of us that big daddy son that we need. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Pastor? Yes. Yeah. What's his name? Kim. Okay. Conway, Conway okay. Kim Conway. Kim Conway. Okay. Thank you. All right. You may be seated. Gary, Malcolm, will come sing it for us. Sunday fast approaching, there are uh, several facts that I have realized that enhance the meaning of this song. Up until the death of Jesus Christ, for the Jewish people, each time they committed a sin, that is, the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, so forth, a sacrifice to God had to be presented. The uh, spotless lamb, pigeons, and in some cases, even birds for the poor. The week Jesus was crucified was the celebration of the Passover, where lamb's blood was placed on the mountain of the homes so that the children would be spared when they were in Egypt. After a mock trial, Jesus was sentenced to be crucified, but first was to be beaten with the cat of nine tails. <coughs> 40 times or 40 less ones, when you think how the first lash of the whip would have started to break the skin and muscles on his back, blood started flowing, <coughs> then the first, and then again, and then again, and then again, how many times? Up to 40 times, barely alive, he was forced to carry the cross to Golgotha. There, he was nailed hand and feet to the cross and hoisted up in, in the air in an upright position. There, tortured, beaten, with blood flowing down his back and face, he never gave up and asked God to stop this event. He forgave one of these on the cross near him, and even the people down where he looked asked God, forgive them because they don't know what to do. When Jesus said it was finished, a new covenant was made with men that the blood of Jesus would be the only sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin to all sinners if they believe in Jesus Christ and accept this gift, Jesus became the only acceptable sacrifice for forgiveness of sin and salvation. The Old Testament animal sacrifices, the celebration week of the Passover, Jesus gave his blood as the last sacrifice that God will accept for forgiveness 
and salvation? Why did God send his son? Why did Jesus say to the bitter end without asking God for help? Love. That's what it was. It was love. Amen. Love for his creation. But you know, he didn't have to suffer because he could have called 10,000 angels. Amen. <coughs> in Washington, D.C., and just started playing a violin. It was a cold January the 12th, 2007 morning. He played six Bach pieces for 45 minutes. During that time, 1,097 people passed by, but only seven stopped to listen to him. The minutes went by, and the middle-aged man noticed that there was a musician, and he stopped his pace and slowed down just for a few seconds, but then took off again, realizing he was probably late for work. A minute later, the violinist received his first dollar tip. A woman threw a dollar into the till without really even slowing down. A few minutes later, someone else leaned against the wall and listened to him, but looked at his watch and he realized he was late, so he took off again. But the one who paid the most attention to the violinist was a little three-year-old boy. He stopped and just looked at the man and listened. But his mother was behind him and she was hurrying him along and pushing him, saying, come on, we gotta go. And more children would stop and look. But that was basically all the stop and look was with kids. And parents and moms would push them and say, come on, we have to go. In the 45 minutes of the play, only six people stopped and stayed for a while. About 20 of them gave him money. His grand total was $32.17. And when he finished playing, the silence took over. No one noticed. No one applauded nor was there any recognition. 
No one knew who this violinist was, but it was Joshua Bell, one of the most brilliant musicians in the world. And he played one of the most intricate pieces of music ever written on a violin that was worth three and one half million dollars. Two days before he was playing in the subway, he had just filled up a house, a, Boston, a theater in, in Boston, where the average seat was $100 a person. And this is a true story, it's a real story. Joshua Bell was playing incognito in this metro station, and it was organized by the Washington Post as a part of a social experiment about perception, tastes, and priorities of people. And the outlines were, in a commonplace environment, at an inappropriate hour, do we appreciate beauty? Do we stop to appreciate it? Do we recognize the talent in an unexpected context? Well, one of the possible conclusions from this experience could be, if we don't have a moment to stop and listen to one of the best musicians in the world, playing the best music ever written, how many other things are we missing? That's right. How many of God's wondrous gifts do we miss? Amen. Beautiful sunset, <clears throat> the rainbow after a storm, the laughter of a child, sitting out in April and the wind is blowing through your hair, that feeling, remember when you were young and you used to love to have that air go through your hair and it would bring a smile to your face? I wonder, what are we missing that God has given us? The title of the sermon this morning is a firm foundation. A firm foundation. Now everyone understands that a house is no stronger than its foundation. And we acknowledge this simple but very powerful truth. But in the same manner, a life is no stronger than its foundation. Up to this passage of scripture, Jesus had been talking to people who were coming to him, wanting to learn how to have a better life. And you know, that's something that should be sensible and admirable of all of us. We all want to, to have a better life. We want to do a better life and live for Jesus. I think most of us want to make the most out of our present lives as well as our eternal lives. But in order for us to do this, our lives have to be built on permanent values that will support us when the storms of life come. And they will. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading Matthew 7, 24 through 29 to you. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Lord, these next few moments, as we look at these few short verses, we've probably all heard sermon after sermon on the mind of so much wealth in these verses. Help me to convey the truth clearly that you love on my heart. Bless my people say here. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you like to fill in the blanks in the bulletin, here is the first one. We must take note of Jesus' very clear teachings. Teachings. Now, both men in this story had the same desire. They had the same opportunity. They wanted nice houses in which their people could live, their family. Now, the houses appear to be almost identical in construction except for one thing, the foundation. But I want you to hear this, and I want to go personal opinion time. I think in this... Jesus is showing us that the houses represent our lives. In this parable, Jesus is not talking about carpentry. He's talking about people. And you know people, for the most part, look the same. You ever go to a grocery store, you notice the guy next to you looks kind of like you. He's got a grocery cart with a lot of stuff in it, like you do. And you say, well, they're kind of what? But when you take a minute and begin to 
to look in that grocery cart and say, well, he's got some different things that, that I don't have. may have liquor. Or may have some real expensive stuff that you wouldn't want. Or may have some stuff that you would say, oh, he's got dog food, I don't want a dog. Or so many other things. That there are some differences in even the behavior of children, the way that they look at their parents. There are some differences. And the more that you look at these people, you begin to see the differences. But on the surface, we're all kind of alike, aren't we? What you see is what you get. But folks, on the surface, things appear to be the same, but they're really not, are they? The thing that demonstrates the differences between these two people is the storm that will come. Now, the storm demonstrates the difference between the two houses, and the difference, very simply, is in the foundation upon which these houses were built. One was built upon a rock, and the other was built upon sand. Now, again, I want to give you some personal opinion time here. I don't think that Jesus is speaking about the trials, the everyday trials that we go through here. Though it's very true that a person whose foundation is built upon God is going to get you through a lot easier than one that doesn't have any hope. Talking about those times when a loved one passes away or when you come down with some destabilizing illness or you lose your job, I will affirm to you that the person whose life is built on the rock is going to be able to get through it a lot easier than the person who's not. But I think that what Jesus is talking about here is on that final day, when that final storm comes. And when that storm comes, it will be obvious what sort of a person you are. Now, I want you to notice in verses 24 and 26 that Jesus is saying both of these people, he describes it as hearing these words of mine. So they're both hearing what Jesus is saying to them. In other words, we might compare these people to people who are in church, who hear the word of God exposited every day. But Jesus is not comparing the person who's in church every Sunday, who reads the Bible every Sunday, with the person who doesn't go to church and the person who doesn't read the Bible. Now this is real important. I want you to catch this. Jesus is describing both people who are religious, both people who claim to be Christians, genuine Christians. Jesus is describing religious people who are listening to what he's saying. But there's a difference. Notice the difference. The one responds in obedience. The other responds in disobedience. The one applies the things that are taught and the other neglects the things that are taught. And this is what it is that creates a huge difference between these two people. One has built his life upon what he hears God saying and believing it and doing it. While the other has built his life upon hearing what God says and neglecting it. You know, I'm 65 years old. I've been in the Church of Nazarene all my life. And I have been exposed to people that are my age down and older who were raised in the church and they know all the catchphrases. They understand all the theological words. They have heard it. But they haven't applied it here. They don't live it. That's right. They know it. They have it up here. They have knowledge. But they don't have heart knowledge. And that's what Christ is talking about here. It couldn't be any clearer in the text. In verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, or in other words, does them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Verse 26 says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them, then do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house upon sand. <clears throat> J.C. Ryle comments here that we have a striking picture of two classes of Christian hearers. Those who hear and do nothing, and those who hear and do as well as hear. They're both placed before us, and their histories are traced to their respective ends. The man who hears Christ's teaching and practices what he hears is like the wise man who built his house upon a stone. He does.
doesn't content himself with just listening to exhortations to repent, believe in Christ, live a holy life. He actually repents. When we repent, we ask God to forgive us for the sins that we've committed against him, and we make a 180 degree turn. We go toward God and away from sin. We don't, we don't stay in the same way. When we get saved, there's a difference in us. Amen. We know there's a difference, and people know there's a difference. They look at us and say, what in the world happened to that guy? What happened to that woman? What has changed about her? And I told you so many, many times, I've had people that got changed by salvation in their in-laws, their, their outlaws, people that they were trying to share Jesus with. They made it too difficult for them. And I remember one as a pastor, a, a, a lady that I went to see, she said, I don't know why Cheryl couldn't share with me what happened to her. That's all I wondered. I've seen a change in her, and I want what she has. It's a change. When we repent, we turn the other way. And so the man who built his house on the foundation of the rock, he's turned away. He's genuinely done all these things. He hasn't just listened to them. He learns to do what's well. He abhors that which is sinful and cleaves to that which is good. He is a doer as well as a hearer. And what's the result? When the times of trial come his way, his religion doesn't fail him. The floods of sickness, sorrow, poverty, and grieving and disappointments, they beat upon him in vain because he's got a strong foundation. God's going to see him through. He knows that God is going to see him through. His religion may have cost him something. And you know, folks, I will say this probably a couple of times. Anything that doesn't cost you anything is not worth that thing. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. Right. But if your religion has cost you something, if you've had to give up something, it's going to be worth something. Understand that. To discover his own interest in Christ may have required many days of earnest seeking, many wrestling over issues. But his labor's not been thrown away. It wasn't wasted. He's not reaping a rich reward. There's a difference. And what about the other fellow? What's his religion doing? It's a type of religion that will break down entirely when the first flood comes. It fails him completely. It doesn't work. And when many of us go through these things, we can kind of say, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Remember what Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Bad things do happen to good people. Do you know that? Yes, they, do. they do. And when bad things come our way, we have the assurance that all things work together for the good because he loves me and I'm going to get through this. There ain't no temptation taking you to that which is common. common. The devil says you're the only one that's ever gone through this. He's a liar and the father of lies. Mm -hmm. Tough times are part of life. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. you. Part of life. The disciples rejoiced that they were able to participate in this type of persecution. And what do we do today? Oh, what are you trying to teach me, God? Maybe he's not trying to teach you anything. He's just trying to give you a way that he can bless you. And sometimes we have the opportunity to be blessed and we run away from it. It's not fair. Why do all these bad things happen to me? Bad things happen to good people. Understand that. That's part of life. You know, I think everyone basically wants the same thing. We want to enjoy life, and we want to enjoy our families, don't we? Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. And we all want to go to heaven when we die. You know, in 20, almost 26 years, I have never had a single person say to me, you know, I want to go to hell. Well, never had one person tell me that. Oh, I've had some kind of joke with them, and I knew they weren't serious, but I've never had anyone say, I want to go to hell. I've heard some people say some stupid things, like, we'll have parties down in hell, and blah, blah, blah. Well, you're not going to have parties if you go to hell. I, I guarantee you that. Scripture's pretty clear. It's not a place of party and reveling. It's a place of torment. It's a, it's a place of persecution. It's a place of fire. It's a place of horribleness. There'll be no parties in hell. It's a terrible place. But how important is it to realize that you and I have the opportunity to choose where we're going to spend eternity? And I 
told you dozens of times, and you quote me, and I hear you say it all the time, God will not send you to hell. If you go to hell, it's because you've chosen to go there. Amen. Understand that. He will not send you to hell. Now, that's one thing I have heard over and over and over. Well, if God is such a loving God, as you say, Pastor, I don't believe he's going to send me to hell. And I usually say, you're right. He doesn't send anyone to hell. You go to hell. You go there because you chose to. Right. You chose to. People don't understand that. We, we call it the Church of the Nazarene. It's one of our Bibles, uh, our articles of faith, free agency. God has given you and I the privilege to choose where we're going to spend eternity. It's up to you. Real simple. Now, the picture, the scripture in this story is very close to that of the one of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. All of them started out with the same goal. They wanted to celebrate the coming of the bridegroom. But when Jesus is telling this parable, he says there are five that were wise and five that were foolish. There were five that made the preparations and five that didn't make the preparations. We have the same story here. There's two men that built a house and they knew possibility the storms were going to come, but they made a decision. One was wise and he built his own rock. And the other built the foundation on sand, which would not hold up. Again, the difference is in the preparation that was made as they awaited the coming of the storm. Matthew 5, verse 45, teaches a similar thing. It tells us that there are many things that all of us are going to face in life simply for the reason that we are human beings. There is no temptation making you to that which is common. We're all going to go through a lot of similar things as part of life. We have to understand that. God's not picking on us. He's not saying, I want you to get Charles today because I will see how good he is. No. These things happen to all of us because we are human beings. But here's the test. The test is how we react when these bad things come our way. How do we react? Well, since everyone faces the same difficulties, what is a Christian's advantage? Now, in verse 24, we read that those who listen to Jesus survive life's difficulties. The foolish man is looking for a convenient and an easy way to build his house quickly. But when the storm came, his house is destroyed. It's wiped out. It's gone. Now, it should be noted, while we have the freedom of choice, how we're going to conduct our lives, every choice that we make has a price tag. Everything that you do has a price tag. Parents, your life is a guidebook to your kids. Grandparents, your lives are a guidebook to your grandchildren. They watch you. They watch what you do. You're a role model to them. You may not think that you are, but you are. If grandma says it's okay, or dad says it's okay, or mom or grandpa, then it's okay whether it is or not. They're watching what you say. And sometimes we get caught by our kids and grandkids and we say, well, do what I say, not what I do. Cop out. They're watching you. You are the guidebook to your kids. <laughs> Now, the second blank in your bulletin, probably wondering if we were going to get to it. <laughs> Jesus has given truths to us upon which we can build our lives, build our lives. Matthew chapter 5 is kind of a good uh, thing about the Beatitudes. It begins to tell us all these things that God wants to do for us. And we get to chapter 6, and it's here that Jesus is telling us what God expects of us. You want to know what God expects of you as a Christian? Read Matthew chapter 6. Real simple. Matthew chapter 6. And here Jesus is describing an inner condition that will produce peace in our lives. And we who live Matthew 6, 33, know that our Father is going to take care of us. You know it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you as well. That's right. If I put my total trust in God, 
do what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, I don't worry about all this other stuff. That's right. That's basic stuff, isn't it? Amen. Seek God first, put Him and His will first, and trust Him that He's going to take care of you. There have been so many, many times in faith in our lives where we've had financial problems coming our way, and I said, oh my goodness, how are we going to get through this? Seek you first the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? David said it this way, Psalm 37, 25, Once I was young, and now I am old, yet never have I seen the righteous forsaken nor received begging for bread. Amen. That's a promise. Amen. That's a promise. Grab it. Run with it. If you can live that life, you're going to have peace in the midst of the storms. Matthew 6, 33. And then the third blank. In today's passage, Jesus has given us some final lessons, lessons for a great life. In verses 7 through 12, he gives us confidence in our ability to please God. You know, sometimes I've, I've, I've worked with young people, children, teenagers, and parents have said, would you talk to a pastor? I, I can't do anything with them. They're just a discipline problem. And I begin to talk to them. And you know, one of the things I find out with a lot of teenagers is, you know, no matter what I do, I can never please my dad. I can never please my mom. Whatever I do is not right. I remember a teenager at my last church that was just a wonderful young man. And he said, I can't do anything to please my mom. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I put the dishes in the dishwasher to try to help, and she'll come in and redo it. Or if I vacuum the floor, she'll come in and say, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And I spend all kinds of time just trying to keep my room clean and looking nice, and she'll come in and find fault with it. She'll pick, pick, pick. So no matter what I can do, it's never right. I can never do anything right. And sometimes I think we feel that way about God. Well, no matter what I do, it's not going to please God. That's not true. God wants us to do our best. He does not ask for perfection. He asks us to be faithful. He wants us to be faithful. We do our best. And you know it's always good enough. If you give him your best, it's always good enough. Jesus clarifies how we can get the help we need to please the Father. He says it in three words. Ask. James said you have not because you ask not. How are you gonna how are you gonna know what you the answer is if you don't ask? Ask. Seek, another word for seek is look. Look for what the problem is. Try to work on it. And then knock. Be persistent. Knock until you get an answer. But then Jesus goes on and he alerts us to some of the dangers that we're going to face too. He points out that there are two ways that we can travel. Now take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew 7, 13. Matthew 7, 13. And if you don't have this one highlighted, you have to highlight it. It's a good verse. Very, very powerful verse. 13 and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There's not going to be, majority of people are not going to go to heaven. Did you know that? It's not because God says you're bad and throwing you out. It's because they've chosen not to. It's because they have chosen to take a shortcut. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. If it is to be, it's up to me. me. How simple that is. And he points out in verse 15 that there are two types of teachers. There are the false prophets. And a lot of times we think false prophets, well, that's a preacher in the church. No, it might be a friend of yours that's giving you bad advice. You ever had somebody come up and tell you what you're doing wrong as a Christian? And they're in left field, but they come across so strong, you begin to think, well, maybe what they're saying about me is true. 
And so you begin to make all kinds of changes, and you know what? They were full of baloney. <laughs> they, they were just giving you a line. There are two types of teachers. Watch out for false prophets, verse 15. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And then in verse 21, he warns us that there's only one way to please the Father, and that's through obedience. In verse 24, he clearly indicates to us that there are two alternatives for the construction of our lives. We can build our foundation upon the sand or upon the rock. The choice is up to you. Each one of us then is in a choice, is in a position to make an intelligent choice. But folks, once the house is built, you can't really put it on a foundation, can you? The time for establishing a firm foundation is in the beginning. And again, those warning verses in 21 through 23. Let me read that to you. If you've got your Bible open, look at that 21 and 23, Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of our Father and the one who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I think that probably even today would be a good time to ask, what would he say to me on that day? Would he say, well done, I've been a faithful servant in the joys of heaven? Or would he say, King James, if you depart from me, I never knew you? Well, the scriptures urge us to be honest before God. The book of Lamentation, a very small little, little book, chapter 3, verses 43 42, tells us this. Let us examine and see what we have done and then return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hands and pray from our hearts to God in heaven. We have sinned and turned against you and you've not forgiven us. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul admonishes the church, not sinners, the church, to examine themselves. And I would submit we need to examine ourselves on a daily basis. Every day. For once the storm comes, it's too late. Remember the teachings in verses 24 through 27. Would you stand with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If Jesus Christ were physically in this sanctuary and he stood right in front of you, can you get a picture of that? What would he say to you? Would he say, well done, I'm good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of heaven? Or would he say, you've disappointed me? I really never knew you. Depart from me. The words that I just said, King James, are what Jesus is going to say one day. Well done, enter in or depart from me. And I don't know, maybe some of you are not into prophecy, but if you're into prophecy and you listen to some of these high-powered prophecy preachers, they are so excited. They believe that maybe even this year might be the rapture. Wouldn't that be great? Amen. I told Faith, I said, wouldn't that be great? I'd love for my bill collectors to try to get their money this year after the rapture of the church. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? But until then, we'll just keep paying the bills. But what if 2014 were the year? The rapture is going to take place in the twinkling of an eye. That is, are you ready for this? One millionth of a second. You won't have time to get ready if you're not ready. That's how quick it's going to be. The day that Christ will rise first and we which are alive will meet him in the air. Won't that be great? Won't that be wonderful? And, you know, I was sitting there this morning watching you while Gary was leading the singing, and I thought, you know, some, some of the folks look like, oh, my, Monday's coming. But wouldn't it be great if, if Monday was a day of the rapture? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I sure don't want to miss it, and I hope you don't want to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. 
You know, we all have loved ones that they're going to miss it unless someone tells them about Jesus. You know, we're living in a day and age. I get stats from George Barton, who's a Christian poll taker, and he tells me that we're trying to witness to a church, to a people who don't even believe that there is a God. We're trying to save a people who don't think they need to be saved. That's the task we've got. Jesus said at the end there will be a great falling away of the very elect. We're seeing that. And many of you have shared with me, you know people who 30 years ago were very faithful soul winners. They were involved in the church and now they're coming out of church. We are in the last days. And folks, I will do everything I can to make sure I don't miss it. And I hope that's your prayer. But again, aren't you glad the church of Nazarene still has altars? Some of the churches have taken altars away. And if you do get them to come down and stand in the front, they don't know what to do. But in the meet that we can just come, if we want to talk to our Father, we can just come and kneel on that real comfortable cushion, open our heart up to Him. And 1 John 1 9 again was written not to sinners, it was written to the church. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes Things get us down, and we can allow a bad attitude to get into our lives. And, you, and I've heard over the years, I've been around Christians, and this is the way they would describe it. You feel like you're walking on eggshells when you're around them. If that describes you, you got a bad attitude. And you need to ask Jesus to forgive you, and He will. He will. Head to bow behind your clothes and real quickly, I want to open the altar. If there's any Christian here that needs to pray to Jesus, anything in your life that you need to talk to them about, maybe it might be personal, it might be a kid or a grandkid or a situation that's going on in your life, would you like to come and pray? And I could hold you on. Anybody at all? George Bratton, would you close in the prayer for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and blessings upon our lives. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have a lot that we can build our lives upon that gives us hope beyond this world. Lord, we pray that you 